If you have your Bibles, I want to uh, invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And if you are uh, visiting with us, we are making our way through the book of Ephesians. Uh, we're looking at this idea, uh, doctrine that dances. We, we aren't just studying uh, Ephesians just to harvest doctrine, to fill our minds up. We think it should affect our heart and affect how we live and it should change us. And so that's sort of our bent. We want to see what God has to say about himself and about salvation, but we also want it to cause us worship and adoration and security to rest in him and to change us. And so uh, thank you for being with us. Ephesians 2, we're in verses 1, and we'll stop at the end of verse 9. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we ask now for wisdom. We ask now for your spirit, the one who borrowed Paul's mind and borrowed Paul's hands and borrowed Paul's personality. And he wrote this letter being led by you. We pray, Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, that you would also work in our hearts now to bring understanding and joy and worship and clarity and reverence and awe. Would you have your way with us, we pray, for the glory of Christ. Amen. Remembering and forgetting. Those are two sort of common experiences for everyone. And there are times when forgetting things, when it's really good. And I'll give you an example. A young lady who, uh, a young girl who walks in at, let's say she's age 10, and her mother's had a, a massive heart attack. And she walks in 10 minutes too late and she sees her mother lying on the kitchen floor. That while other girls her age, they might want an iPad or they might want to watch a, their show on television. For this 10 year old girl, she wants to forget, right? that every night when she goes to bed, that that is the image that puts her to sleep of seeing her mother in that posture. She doesn't want to forget her mother, right? She loves her mother, but she, she wants to forget that image. And therefore, forgetting in that place, it's a good thing, being able to move on, being able to lay your head down and not see that image and be haunted by it. In that case, forgetting is a blessing. It's one of the privileges of, of God where I think about my life and some things that I've done or seen. And it's a privilege, right? It's a privilege when the Lord says, you know what? You will not think about that. You will forget that. I'm going to remove that. There are times in our lives where forgetting is a blessing. And there are other times when remembering is a blessing. I remember when I married my wife. I remember what day it was on, right? And I better remember when May 15th rolls around, right? I need to act like I remember something sacred and special and beautiful. It's important to remember when your kids were born and it's important to remember their names. It's important to remember when you go to bed to lock the door. It's important to remember when you get paid to go pay your bills, right? Like try forgetting some of that stuff, right? Sometimes it's important to forget and sometimes it's important to remember. And here's what I'm learning about my fallenness. 
is that I often remember the things that I shouldn't. And I forget the things that I should remember. That a part of our brokenness is we will hold fast to someone hurts you, right? Someone hurts you in the past and they, they wound you and scar you. It does not matter what they do for the next 15 years. Your mind is stuck on the pain, right? You are remembering something that in, in Jesus's economy, give grace and forgive and let's let's move on. But we can't. We're stuck. And those important things that happen to us, right? These important good things that should be seared on our memories. Those are the things we don't remember. And here's what Paul is doing in our text. He is saying, hey, I know there are some things you need to forget. You need to forget what lies behind and press forward. Right. But here's what I'm doing today. I'm telling you what I'm about to tell you does not belong in the forget pile. It belongs in the pile of things that you need to remember. And you need to fight to remember what Paul does in our text is walk these people down memory lane. It's important to remember he's talking to Christians. He just talked about the heights of God's love in chapter one. He talked about them being adopted into the family of God. He talked about them being engrafted into God's family through the down payment of the life of Jesus Christ. He's talked about that. He celebrated their faith in Jesus and their love for Christ. Right. And then it's as if he's saying it's not always been that way. And it's important uh, uh, with all these heights and these good things for me to take you by the hand and to walk you back down your path. Let's take a walk down memory lane. Paul's not writing Ephesians 2 to non-Christians. He's writing it to Christians, Christians that he has just celebrated. And he thinks it is so important that though they are loved and accepted, that they remember that things were not always this way. And the case that I want to make is that that's important for us. If it was important for them to walk down this path of remembering, then it's important for us. As a matter of fact, you, you see it in chapter two, uh, all the way through one through nine. He's jogging their memory and then he picks it back up. Look at chapter two, verse 11. Therefore, remember that at once. So in other words, what Paul's doing in the chapter two is walking them back in history. Now. He wants them to. Never forget that they were dead. That's the first thing. That Paul would not be popular in our day. That one of the reasons why I think he got beat down in a lot of the cities is because he did not come in there with this lofty view of humanity. He came in there saying, man, we're dead. Right. That, that if he wrote a book and, and, and his his anthropology, it would not sell on our modern bookshelves because he does not think that mankind is fundamentally alive towards God. He does not think that mankind is fundamentally good in the sight of God. And it matters what we think, but what matters most is what God thinks about us and how God sees and what Paul says God sees. You were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You followed the course of the world. You followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And that's a lot. And you got to unpack it. And the first thing we see is that Paul, when he looks at humanity and what these Christians were, he says, you were dead. And you walked. You were dead in your sins and you walked and you followed the course of the world. You followed the prince of the power of the air. So think about that, th that image, right? Walking dead. It conjures up the name of a series, right? The Walking Dead. And, 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 and in that storyline, it's the, the zombie apocalypse where you have these dead people kind of walking around like this, you know. And here's what Paul is saying. It's like, that's actually a biblical, that's a good view, right? That's, there's some truth in naming that and starting that series. It's actually telling us more than we think it is. And Paul says, at one point you were dead and therefore you walked now, it makes perfect sense that if you were walking, Paul says, where, where were you going? He says that you were following after or going after the course of this world. This path that you were on was the path of the world. And at the end of it, at the end of it was destruction and wrath. And it awaited you. That's what at the end of the path. And here's what he says. You weren't just walk following the course of the world. That th you weren't just a dead person walking. But at the front of that line was a mighty ruler. 
Look at what it says, that you were following the course of the world and you were also following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Here's what Paul is saying. At the front of the line is Satan. And Satan is a spirit, an evil spirit who revolted against the Lord, who hates the Lord, who hates God's people, who hates God's glory, who hates God's gospel. And at one point, Paul says, you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins and you followed the course of the world and the course of the world is following after the spirit. Now, notice what Paul says about the prince of the power of the air, which is the spirit that is now at work. First, he says he's now at work. So notice he doesn't go past tense, even though he's taking them past tense to where they were. They were dead. He doesn't say you were following the course of the world, the spirit who was at work. He says, no, that same spirit who enslaved you, who you were following after, he is now at work, still at work right now. And, and, and how were you labeled? Look at what it says. You are a son of disobedience. You did not desire God. And that sonship word is important because it's being contrasted with this idea that God chose you before the foundation of the world to be adopted through Jesus Christ as a son. And what here's what Paul is saying. At one point, you, even though you're in and you are a son of God, this has not always been true. At one point, you were co-signed to the devil and you were a son of disobedience. Now, who does this apply to, right? Who, who does this apply to? Look at what it says. And you were dead. You all were dead in which you all once walked. So uh, on the, at this part, he's talking to the Gentiles, right? He, Ephesus was not a predominantly Jewish city. There were Jewish people who lived there, but Ephesus was not a predominantly Jewish city. And so when he talks about the you and the, the pronoun usage, he's talking about the Gentiles, and you Gentiles were dead and once you walk, once walked. And so if you were a Jew in the, the reading of this letter, you might hear him read this and your chest might kind of stick out. Right. Well, I'm good, man. Y'all are bad. Y'all are following Satan. But then I mean, just think about it like that. But then look at what he says in verse three. Among whom we all once lived. in the passions of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. You see the shift? First he says, you Gentiles, you were this. And then in one verse, he says, we, indicting himself. And then he indicts the entire world, the rest of mankind. Now, how can this be? Paul says it, that something is wrong with us on the natural level. He says that we were by nature, by nature, children of wrath. Andrew Lincoln has a commentary on Ephesians and about that phrase right there, by nature. Here's what he writes, because I think Paul is saying more than what we see when we initially read it. He says, by nature can mean by the natural order of things as in Romans 1 26 or 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, but the actual expression when it is written as it is in Ephesians chapter two, it's parallel occurs elsewhere. It occurs in Galatians two fifteen, and there Paul writes, we who are Jews by nature. And clearly in that text, nature refers to that which comes to us by virtue of our birth. You hear what he's saying? So when we read by our nature, children of wrath, when you lay Galatians 2 on top of it, by nature, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a word for by birth. So by our very birth, by being born, we come here corrupted. We come here co-signed to evil. We come here following after the prince of the power of the air. And I know our children, they look good. They look pretty. We goo goo eyes over them. But here's what Paul is saying, right? They come here bent towards evil by being born. Now, here's why, because the scripture is consistent, right? That we have this mysterious union with our first parents, Adam and Eve. 
and sin enters the world through death and death spreads to all. And, and, and that comes down to us by virtue of our being born. And that's why Jesus says you must be born again. Right. Because Jesus understands that by virtue of our birth and union with Adam, that we come here defective. Now, here's the problem, right? Paul says you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead. Here's the problem, right? We don't feel dead. If you ask me 20 years ago, before I was a believer, if I felt dead, I would slam this thing. It says, no, I was very much alive. I got pictures to prove it. I'm in a yearbook, right? I got, I got a, a graduation certificate, certificate to prove that I was alive and going to school, right? I got, I got all of this proof that I was alive, so how can you tell me I'm dead? I don't feel dead. And if you're here this morning and you're not a believer and you don't feel dead, I want to kind of press on that a little bit. Could you be in the same shape that Bruce Willis was in the movie Sixth Sense? If you haven't seen the movie, I'd encourage you to go see it. But Bruce Willis is this famous psychiatrist or psychologist who specializes in working with children. And he's getting this great award and he, he comes out and uh, he encounters this other kid that told him earlier on in his life that I see dead people. And Bruce Willis kind of brushes this kid off like, dude, you're crazy. You, you, you're, you're off your rocker, whatever, whatever. And so then Bruce meets a second kid, right? A second kid who tells him, I see, you know, he, he starts to counsel this guy because I see things and see people, right? And so then this little boy, I think his name is Cole. Isn't his name Cole? I think his name is Cole. And, and he, 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 Bruce has been meeting with him. And he says, OK, I'm ready to tell you my secret. And Bruce Willis says, well, what is it? And he says, I see dead people. <laughs> and it's the classic M. Night Shyamalan. I mean, it's like it focuses in, right? I see dead people, right? And then Bruce Willis is like, oh, OK, so when do you see him? And he says, he says, when you're asleep, when you're alive, he says, all the time. <laughs> and Bruce Willis is like, what? And he says, I see them everywhere. And they think they're alive. And they choose not to see what's right in front of them. And so at that point, Bruce Willis kind of has to make a decision, right? Do I believe this kid or what? And here's the, the twist in the movie. After that encounter, Bruce Willis goes home and he walks in his door and his wife is asleep on a couch. And it's obviously their anniversary in his mind. He's like, oh, man, I forgot the anniversary again. Right. He walks in and sees her asleep on the couch and she and she's watching the video of their wedding. And as she's watching it, he's watching her watching it. And he's watching. I mean, he's watching her sleep and he's watching the video. Then his wedding ring falls out of her hand. And at that point, he's like, wait, that's my ring. And he looks at his own finger. And he's like, oh, man, I haven't been wearing my ring. And so then he's like, oh, OK, that's weird. Then he goes to the kitchen table where they had supposedly had dinner. And there's not two plates at the table. There's one. And he's like, wait a minute. I thought I sat down to eat dinner with her. And then in his mind, he kind of there's this flashback. I see dead people who think they're alive. And he hears that again. And then his mind takes him back to the time that they went out to dinner. And he tries to reach for uh, the, the, the check and his wife takes it and she pays for it. And it hits him like right then that he's dead. That he got shot at the beginning of the movie. The bullet that the other kid hit him with, it killed him. He thought he had recuperated. And the entire movie is about a dead man walking around the movie who thinks he's alive. And that is what the Bible is saying about you. That you were just like, I was just like Bruce Willis in the movie. That we walk around buying stuff and drinking stuff and reading stuff and doing stuff. And we think we're alive. And scripture says, no, brother, you were dead. Now, here's the thing. I know that, that. All right. Push back. Push push back on me. If scripture is true. 
which it is. And it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, not beholding God, not seeing God, not aware of God. Dead people don't think and see and are aware of anything. And so when Paul takes that metaphor and dumps it upon us and he says that, that, that wouldn't it be consistent? That if you're dead towards God, you wouldn't even know it. Wouldn't that be consistent with what scripture is saying? That if your spiritual faculties don't work, that they're dead, if your heart is bent towards evil, do you actually think you're alive enough to feel your deadness? That it actually takes a passage like this one. It's like you, if you were sick and you go to the doctor and you feel fine, you feel perfect. And the doctor, you go for your checkup and he, he, you get your scans. He said, hey, but I, I see something in your heart that's not right. Oh, doc, I'm good. I don't feel it. I'm good. I'm straight. And he's like, well, no, no, I see this. And this is like right there. What happens in that moment, your feelings or the lack thereof, they are not strong enough to tell you what's happening right inside of here. You have to step outside of yourself to something that can diagnose what's really true. And that's wouldn't that be true spiritually? Might it be true spiritually if you were truly dead in your trespasses and sins that one of the ways that, that death will manifest itself is through blindness and not even seeing it. And that's what Paul is doing. He is taking the light of the gospel and shining it upon people. Now, here's the thing. The symptoms are already there. We just don't see them. And you see them in the text, right? That how do you know if you're dead? Look at verse one. You are dead in your trespasses and sins on a behavioral level. It's it's this idea that you're running, running and you're falling. Right. It's this idea that you're taking this shot and you're missing the target. Isn't that true for every one of us in this room? How many of us have even been able to live up to our own standards? Aren't we always missing the mark? Aren't we always falling short? That's what Paul is saying. When you see the falling short, when you see God's law and you're not measuring up to it, it is a sign that you're dead. Look at what he says in in verse two. That we were living according to the passions of uh, verse three, the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So now he's getting from a behavioral level. He's moving in on a on a heart level. Haven't you always haven't we all felt a strong desire towards evil? Haven't we felt this draw towards that which is unholy? Haven't we felt this over desire for something good that we want this thing above everything else? Haven't we under desired the things of the Lord? That that's what Paul is saying. If you don't buy it on the behavioral level, at least reason with me on the desire level. Our desires, your desires are not right. And then he drops this bomb and it's this bomb in in verse two. Look at what he says that that. The prince of the power of the air, the, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, that word right there, disobedience. It's apathia, right? Which sounds a lot like apathy. It's where we get our English word apathy from. And so not only is it messing up and not doing the right things, not only is it this over desire for the right thing or this over desire for the wrong thing. Here's the Paul saying, if you still think you're good on on the behavioral level, on the desire level, let me take it right here. Apathy. You see, apathy isn't a man coming in here, dropping a bomb and blowing everybody up. That's not apathy, right? Apathy is not caring. It's being numb. It's not caring about the glory of God. It's when he talks about being a son of disobedience, a son of apathy. You are indifferent. You don't care. You see, I think that knocks out about everybody, right? Knocks us all out. These are the symptoms. Now, why do we need to remember it? Why does God say, remember that you were dead? I want to think it's a window into the world. That I know when we see evil and injustice and just demonic and dark stuff that happens in the news and in our city and in our nation and in our world. That Paul is saying. This is where it comes from. When you're co-signed to Satan, right, 
when you're following the course of the world after the demonic, you will see demonic things. And here's what happens. Like when I see some of this stuff, my first impulse is anger. And here's the thing I read about Jesus. As people are crucifying him and about to betray him, you know what his prayer was? It says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. They're acting dead. They're doing what dead people do. Dead people destroy life. Dead people rebel against God. But even as Jesus is going the way of the cross, he sees, Father, they're dead. And Father, they don't know what they're doing. I think our knee-jerk reaction can't be anger. Anger at sin, yes, but compassion towards dead people. Compassion. I think this is a window into a truly healthy covenant community that Paul regularly reminds his readers of his former life. In Ephesians 2, he says, we all did this. In 1 Timothy 1, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. I acted in ignorance and unbelief. In Romans 7, I did not know what it was to covet until the law told me. And when the law did tell me, I became covetous in all types of ways. Romans 7, the good that I want to do, I do not do. The evil that I do not want to do, that is what I keep on doing. Galatians chapter 1, they heard in my former life, I persecuted the church and tried to destroy it. In other words, this is the super apostle who's been caught up into the third heavens, who's seen visions and dreams and things that he can't remember. And you want to know his way for loving people? It was not this posture. You get it together, right? It was like, you know what? I was in that line with you, homie. I was right there with you in this. I know what it's like to be yoked up with evil. That C.S. Lewis, this quote about friendship, that that we we quote him a lot, right? And I think we miss the, the other side of it, right? He says, friendship arises out of mere companionship. When two or more companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest or taste which others do not share which until that moment each believed to be his own unique treasure. And he says, and or burden. The typical expression of opening a friendship would be like this. What? You two? I thought I was the only one. It is when two such persons discover one another and this burden or treasure they have in common that friendship is born. When we hear that passage, when we hear that quote reference, it's always in the context of Christians, right? Christians, we have Jesus in in, in common. Now we have each other in common and let's go this way. But in the original in the original quote, it wasn't just Christians. It says treasures or burdens. And I want to put before you that one of the healthiest ways to love the world Christian. Is to empathize with the burden. To remember the darkness that covered your heart. See, if we can get together and do church and only show how strong and mighty and how deliberate we were, we will never create an atmosphere for broken people. But if we can own them both, I'm friends with the church because of our union with Christ, and I can relate to the world because my bondage and sin, my former bondage and sin, See, I think Paul is setting us up for something greater in the rest of the letter where he's actually teaching them how to be the church. He says, we got to walk down memory lane. You have to. You have to remember that you were dead. The second thing Paul says is don't forget who rescued you. And it was God. God didn't leave you. This is like the most this is the most one of the most important Passages in the scriptures, you get all of man's condition in verses one through three. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. Right. If I could just read that. Right. But God. Right. You could just like just stay right there. But God. Right. Like it's important. And linguistically, this God is the subject of the whole sentence. 
And made alive is the main verb. And it's, it's as if Paul is writing, yeah, this is what you were. 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 But God showed up and God made you alive. And so what do we contribute to our salvation, Christian? And the answer is your sin and death. That's what you and I bring to the table. We did not make ourselves alive. The scripture says that even while we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but God. God made us alive, that he himself sovereignly came upon you and made himself known to you. He himself sovereignly sought you out. And that's what you're going to see in the text is that Paul is about lifting up the sovereignty of God. Now, it's not always appropriate to ask God why, right? I mean, just in my house, especially you had like this much margin for asking why, right? If, if your parents ask you to do something and you say why, you might get popped in the mouth. You just, you just don't, you don't ask adults why, right? Here's what God does. God actually lets us ask him why. Like, why would God make me alive in Jesus? Like, Father, why would you do it? And he doesn't slap you in the mouth. He says, okay, I want to tell you. I'm going to tell you why I did it sovereignly. And he lists us four reasons. The first thing is in verse four. It says, because, but God being rich in mercy. He doesn't just say God being merciful. It says God who is rich in mercy. Mercy implies that someone has done something that deserves punishment but the one who has the power to punish refuses to punish. And Paul says God is rich in this. He has this abundant supply of mercy to give sinners, to, to not give sinners what they truly deserve. God says we were by nature children of wrath. We had earned wrath. But his mercy says, I will not pour my wrath on you. That's mercy by God not giving us what we deserve. He's merciful. He's rich in it. Verse four, because of the great love with which he loved us. Again, he doesn't say because he loved us. It says his love for us is great. Now, what moves this God who has the power and right to punish sinners with his wrath? What moves him to not do it? It says his great love. Now, why is his love great? Think about Ephesians one. It says this love with which he has loved us even before the foundations of the world. His love is great because his love is old and it predates all things. His love is great also because it is not just an, a verb. It is not just a feeling. It is a verb. Notice what it says. That even because of the great love with which he loved us, verse five, even when we were dead, he made us alive. So right there, get, get the nuance. It's a love that moves towards you in your deadness to say, son or daughter, live. Follow me. Be mine. That it sounds a whole lot like Hosea chapter three. If you've read that prophet that Hosea has to marry Gomer and Gomer isn't the most faithful wife. And Gomer leaves Hosea and he, she goes and she lives with another woman. And in Hosea chapter three, you know what God tells Hosea? He says, go, that's the commandment, go. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress and bring her back into your home. As such does the Lord love the children of Israel. Think about this image, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, following the course of the world, following after Satan. And God says, I love you. I love you. But not just love. I love you. Now you come to me. It's a love that says I will go to you that even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, I say rise and I say you come home and you be with me forever. It is that type of love that it pursues people. Look at verse five. The third reason it's by grace, by grace, you have been saved. You see, mercy is God withholding something that we deserve, namely punishment. That's one side. Grace is the other side. It's God giving to those whom he given mercy something that they did not deserve. And so it, it covers all the bases. 
Mercy says, Lord, you, your wrath needs to be poured on me and you will choose sovereignly because you love me not to pour it out. But not pouring out your wrath is not where God wants to stop. God wants to do more than not just pour his wrath on you. He wants to lavish you with the righteousness of his son. And that is grace. And that was that is what makes grace and mercy different. But they complement each other. And notice what he says about this grace, about this grace. Go down in verse seven. It, it, it too, is immeasurable. Why would God do it? He's rich in mercy. Why would he do it? He loves you with a great love. Why would he do it? Because his grace is immeasurable. Why else would God do it? Verse seven, so that in the coming ages he might show off the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus. Can you believe that? That one of the reasons God wants to save us and does save us is to show off his own kindness and grace to demons, to Satan, to the watching world. We are like trophies of grace. All right. I, so I, I'm a basketball fan and I, I'm so glad that NBA basketball has started. So look, man, I, I, I got LeBron here and, and here's the thing. Mankind, we've always been showcasing our accomplishments forever. If you got two or three degrees and I walk into your office and you're going to let people know you have a bachelor's, you have a master's, you have a PhD, it's going to be out there on a the wall, right? We celebrate what we do on your resume. You can't make it one page. You got to make it two or three, right? You're listing all the things that you've accomplished. And these athletes do it as well, right? Now, there's a meme I was going to put up here, right? But it, it has like LeBron and, and, and LeBron is like, hey, Kobe, look at here. Right. And he has his little trophies. And then the next slide, Kobe's like, kid, please. Right. <laughs> and, and so he has more championships. And then the next slide and Michael Jordan is he's sitting there smoking a cigar. Right. He, he's smoking this cigar like little kids, please. Right. And then John Wooten, who's a coach of UCLA, he's like, oh, little boys, it's not even a game. Right. That's John Wooden, coach at UCLA. Here's what we've been doing from the beginning of time, celebrating our trophy, celebrating those things in life that we have accomplished and putting them on display for the world to see. And here is what Paul is saying about you. Your trophy. He's putting you on display wherever you go now and for the coming ages. He has sovereignly loved you and raised you from the dead and made you his own. And he stands right there, just like John Wooden, in the middle of all of you, telling everyone, look, this is grace. This is mercy. It's on display. Now, just so that we don't sort of slip in any room to boast, notice how he rounds up this section. He says, just in case you don't get what God is trying to say, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of your works, so that no one may boast. Like that's, that's where it's all rounding out. You were dead. You contributed your sin to your death. And it was God being rich in mercy. With, because of his great love, he sovereignly went towards you and he raised you. He has saved you. And there is no room to boast. There is no room to boast because it is all by God's grace. It's where God draws a line and says, I'm different from all other religions. Other religions say, do this and be accepted. They say, do this and I will love you. Do this and you're in. And God says, no, my religion doesn't work that way. It's been done by another. The righteousness has been given by another. The wrath of God has been pouring out on another. And all you do is accept it freely by faith. That's it. No working. No working. 
And so when we talk about mercy, when we talk about God not giving us what we deserve, it begs the question, then who gets what we deserve? And the Bible says Jesus. Jesus gets the wrath that you deserve. Mercy is not just God not giving you what you've earned, which is hell. Mercy is God taking that which was due you and putting it on another. That if God is gracious and he gives us what we don't deserve, namely himself and glory, then where does the righteousness come from? That, too, comes from Jesus. That's the reason Jesus lived and lived a beautiful, perfect, godly life that God may credit it to you and give you grace. And so Jesus, there was no mercy for Jesus. There was no grace. And therefore, we get it. Now, why would Paul want them to remember that God has saved you. I'll give you four H's. The first one is our humility. That pride should not be in the vocabulary of a believer. And I know we're prideful, right? But this undermine that, that, that no one may boast, right? That if we truly understood these two truths, that I was dead and only God, God made me alive, that that, that all of some of the isms you see in the world, they would not exist. If we just fundamentally believe this, that we are born condemned, that there is no one who has a better standing or posture before God and your race or your class or your sex, that these things Do not give you an up or a down. We're all down, says Paul. I think Paul is setting us up for something that's going to come later when he talks about these Jewish Christians and these Gentile Christians and their way to move forward together. And you have the Jews over here who have all the rights and all the privileges and all the history and all the writings and all the revelation. They have this. And now you have these Gentiles coming in and it might be tempting in this place to look at them with disdain, to look at them with arrogance. And what Paul says is, no, no, you can't. No one is righteous. No, not one. Not Jew, not Greek, nor black, nor white, not Mexican, not, not anybody. Like, no one is righteous. Not one person. And therefore, no one can stand up before God and hold their chest out like you've done anything. We are, have all fallen short of the glory of God. This is for our humility, our mutual humility moving forward. That, that, that if we really got this, when you got like so, sort of early American history, That racism wouldn't exist, right? Like if if we actually believe this, I'm reading this book by the, it's The Baptism of Early Virginia by Rebecca Goats, I guess that's how you say her name. And she talks about this term, hereditary heathenism. And it was this term that was kind of thrown around in early American history in which they assigned dignity to people based on skin color. And so if you were brown skinned, you were deemed a hereditary heathen, incapable of saving grace. And therefore, it's okay. It's okay because I have have marred the image of God in you. You are you cannot be saved. Right. That that was the posture. And therefore, as you lived life, then you sort of live with this dual reality. Like I'm spiritual, I'm good, and they're less than me. And here's the thing, that's a really good term, hereditary heathenism. But you know what? It needs to be applied to everybody. Everybody. We're all hereditary heathens. We're all born here incapable of saving ourselves. Skin color does not make you more prone to being a heathen. It's your union with Adam. You're a heathen because you're united to your Adam, who's the first heathen. Right. If we really got that idea, so much in our history would not even exist. It's pride. The second reason I think Paul takes them down memory lane is for hope. It provides hope because I know some of you live in homes where one person is, is a believer and one is not. I know some of us or some of you have children and they're not walking with the Lord. They're doing some messed up stuff with their lives. They're 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 apathetic to Christianity at the best and maybe even hostile. And I know what it's like to pray and to hope and to want and to want them to. Look, I don't care what you do. I just want you to know Jesus. You know, that's kind of my prayer now for my kids. Talking to my wife last night, I said, babe. I just want my kids to know the Lord. I, that, that's, that's about it right now, you know? 
they know Jesus, we good, you know. But I know some of you live under this cloud. Man, my husband's heart is dark. My son's heart is dark. And they're not following the Lord. And the hope of this passage is this, that God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, God himself can make even the darkest heart alive. This passage is hopeful. The third thing this passage does is it it helps us, right? That the same God who was rich in mercy, who has great love and, 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 and immeasurable grace, you do know that he doesn't change. He wasn't just that for you when you got saved. And now he's a taskmaster saying, just do right, right? You do know that his posture towards you is the same now. So when you need mercy, he has mercy to give. And when you need love, he has love to give. And when you need grace, he still has grace to give you right now. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your father who reached in to save you is your father who looks at you this way all the days of your life. The fourth H is for hallelujahs, right? I just threw that in there because I feel like so, so much of Ephesians is about God doing these things to the praise of his glory, right? And so when we gather and sing every week, you know what we're doing? We're actually remembering this. So much of the, the many of the songs that we sang today, they're tied into this, that one of the ways that we respond to being dead and God saying live and God saying rise is through praise and adoration. It marks us. That's why we sing every weekend. That's why we sing Christian to celebrate the goodness of God. He says, remember these things. The last thing he says, remember, don't forget that you are seated with Christ. If Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9 help us to understand how we are saved in the past, Ephesians 2, 6 helps us to understand our identity in the present. If you remember what Paul said about Jesus last week when Paul prayed, look at what he says. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. I'm in verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he called you. And go down to verse 19 and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. So right there, Paul says, I want you to know, I want you to remember God's great power. He raised Jesus from the dead. He seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. We confess that whenever we do the Apostles' Creed, but look at what he says here about you, Christian. Look at verse six, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. In other words, he's talking about this reality about Jesus who was dead that the father raised and the father just didn't raise him. He put him at his right hand in heaven above all power and dominion and earthly names. And you know what Paul says? That is true for you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And God says, live. And God raised you. And here's the beautiful thing. And God has seated you in the heavenly places. Now, that's a beautiful truth. And here's why it's beautiful. I often think about my life right down here. And so I'm living life down here in this realm and I'm fighting sin and I'm pursuing holiness And I'm being assaulted and attacked and life is hard. And it's really easy to forget that if you are a believer, you are in two places at the same time. Your feet are on the ground. 
and you see the suffering, you feel the temptation and you see the injustice and it hurts and it presses in. But here's what Paul is saying. What's also true about you, if you are in Jesus, you know where else you are and what else you are. You're seated right up here with Jesus in the heavenly places above all earthly rule and power. And what this means is you're living in two places, Christian. You're on the earth, but he says, don't lose sight that you also reign with Jesus. You're also with God in the heavenly places above all earthly rule and power. And therefore, Satan does not have the chains on you anymore. Therefore, you can make strides in holiness. Therefore, you are above the fray and you know the schemes of the devil. Therefore, you can actually buy faith and armor with God, live out this faith in a way that pleases the Lord. You are Christian, seated with Jesus in the heavenly places, even though your feet are on the earth. And he says, don't forget it. Don't forget it when you're about to lose it and fight in your marriage. Don't forget it when you're being tempted to go do something that you are not a weakling in the strictest sense, that the, the, bond, the bondage of sin is over with. You reign with Jesus. You rule with Jesus. You are in the heavenly places. And Paul says, remember that. Remember that. Remember it. That's coming a long way, right? That we were co-signed to evil, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air. And now God says, no, you follow me. That we were by nature carrying out the desires of the flesh and we were children of wrath. And God says, no, you're not sons of disobedience. You're my sons and my daughters now. That your passions, they, they, they got over on you and they enslaved you, but not no more. I've cut that. You're alive to God now. You can offer your body as a living sacrifice right now through the power of the spirit. These things are true. And Paul says, I don't want you to forget that. Because I'm going to call you in this book to do some radical hard things. And you have to do it from a place that you have everything in this life to do it through the gospel. That's coming a long way, right? That's coming from death. And now we reign. That's coming from control by sin. And now that control has been cut. It comes from walking after the course of the world. Now we walk after Jesus. And you know how we got there? We've come this far by grace. By grace. And God says, remember it. Let me pray for us. Our Father, that's our hope and our prayer. Help us to remember our darkness. Help us to remember our great deliverance in you. Help us to remember that we are seated with Jesus in the heavenly places. That we are participating now in what you're doing to Restore all things that Satan does not have dominion over us. We may be tempted and we may be tried, but greater is you who are in us than he who is in the world. Help us to fight and to live as we really are, sons and queens and kings of the Most High. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's